We want to thank you again for uh, coming here this evening. We'd like to welcome you to the Harlem Graphic Arts Center and to the Center for African <laughs> the Center for African uh, Studies and Education, which we are sort of uh, initiating here with this current series of, of lectures. We want to establish here, or at least start here, a center, of course, that will concern itself with African culture, but not in the purely in the sense of merely um, an academic interest, but a truly activist interest. We would like to see this as the beginning of a number of educational courses uh, that will be of practical value, ones that can translate themselves into uh, concrete accomplishments. In the future, particularly in the fall, I hope that we will be able, of course we will be able, to offer, say, courses uh, in business. And uh, my idea of it would be that at the end of such a course, the people who are members of it would actually go through the complete, concrete operation of owning a business. At the end of the course, you would have incorporated yourself as a company with a board of directors with bylaws and so forth and would have in some kind of way concretely engaged in uh, business or uh, business development. So hopefully what we're trying to do here then is not just uh, another phase where we academically analyze uh, the so-called African situation or the black situation and sort of leave it at that. It is the function of those of us who are part, are part of this the Center for African Studies to actually engage in, in true hand-to-hand -hand combat with the circumstances that surround us as African people. And certainly we will hope you will join us in that effort. Uh, we're developing here, at least attempting to develop here, what uh, has been referred to as a community in the sense of where the teaching and where um, instruction will be given directly to the community for community use and consumption. Because too often vital knowledge and information is locked up in the walls of the college if they are taught there at all. And if the information is to be of value, then it should be made directly available to the people and be used by the people. Again, we are asking your support for the business effort that we are trying to make here at Harlem Graphic Arts. You see that we are a copy center, a print center. We do uh, great uh, all types of printing here. We, of course, are developing our book uh, area. We, are, of course, are trying to project the African image in art, and therefore. It is necessary, as I put it out last uh, week, that I uh, believe what we are trying to accomplish here succeeds. As you can see, we are in the midst, in the Harlem community, of alien forces. And in a sense, those forces would like to see us fail. And we are trying to illustrate in a very concrete way that we, as people, can succeed in our own community. And of course, we can only do that with your support. So we would appreciate your sort of uh, by word of mouth or something supporting what we are doing here and ultimately supporting the black community. I will continue today then with uh, the lecture we started on last week. And uh, we are looking at the psychology of self-hatred and self-defeat. In the first two lectures, we are looking at how self-hatred has been in induced into the psyche of black people. The ultimate point, though, of course, again, is not merely to academically analyze these methods, but to look at them and use them as a foundation for changing our circumstances. 
So, of course, the next two to three lectures will concern themselves with, of course, what methods and procedures should be used to actually change the nature of uh, what I refer to here as self-hatred. In the last week's lecture, the main thrust of, of what I was talking about was that uh, you induce self-hatred, or one of the methods in which self-hatred has been induced, in the African psyche is to associate that psyche with things that are negative, to associate the African body itself with negativity, to associate the black skin, the black physiognomy, the black hair, the, the black body structure itself with things that are evil, with things that connotate uh, negativity, things that uh, indicate inferiority. You will recall that I indicated that one of the major problems we have is that we as African people have permitted the European to be the definer of reality, to be the categorizer of the world, to be the person that names things in the universe. This, this power, having been ceded to the European, has, of course, uh, reflected back on us in the form of self-hatred. Because this power to name, to define, has been used then to negatively name and define black people. We were looking then at the connotations that were attached to the African body itself. I will today quote extensively from Franz Fanon's book, Black Skin, White Mass. A uh, book essentially written uh, in terms of the uh, Antillean black, the Martinican blacks, but which has equal uh, uh, applicability to blacks the world over. In this book, then, he, he makes a very poignant point in reference to the black body itself. Let's look then got a quote here that he makes on page 160. He is making reference to Jean-Paul Sartre's book on uh, anti-Semitism and working some parallels with uh, the things that Sartre talked about in that book. Jean-Paul Sartre, says um, Fanon, has made a masterful study of the problem of anti-Semitism. Let us try to determine what are the constituents of negrophobia. And of course, phobia is a, is a term we use quite frequently in psychology, and I'm sure it's a term you're very familiar with, which of course comes from the Greek word for fear. Let's look then, he states, uh, he states, at the constituents of the fear of the black man. We must recognize that the action of the European toward the black man is not merely one that uh, seeks to express his superiority or his, his uh, vaunted superiority, but also expresses his fear of, of the black man. And to a great extent, it is the European's defense of his fear, defense of himself, that is the basis and foundation of his racism and is the basis and foundation of his attempt to destroy the black man and to recruit the black man in his own destruction through the mechanism of self-hate. When you get people to hate themselves, then they will do a job on themselves. They will self-destruct. And of course, if you want the system to work very, very well, you inculcate them with certain emotions so that they become self-destructive. And in that regard, then you can escape the blame for their destruction and they can perceive themselves as being the only one who is to blame for their destruction. So, he goes on to say, this phobia is to be found on an instinctual biological level, which is the level, of course, we started with last week. At the extreme, I should say that the Negro, because of his body, impedes the closing of the postural schema of the white man. At the point, naturally, at which the black man makes his entry into the phenomenal world of the white man. 
This is not the place in which to state the conclusions I drew from studying the influence exerted on the body by the appearance of another body. And in, in, in uh, parenthesis he states, let us assume, for example, that four 15-year-old boys, all more or less athletic, are doing the high jump. One of them wins by jumping four feet, 10 inches. Then a fifth boy arrives and tops the mark by a half inch. The four other bodies experience a destructuration. So in this sense here, uh, boys who uh, have gained pretty much confidence in themselves as long as they were among themselves, but when a fifth comes along and tops all four of them, they then begin to look at their body in a different sort of light. In a sense, their schema for their body, that is, their image of their body, their outline, their mental outline of their body, is, uh, is now changed as a result of the intrusion into their phenomenal world of this fifth boy. In a sense, then, I believe what um, Fanon is saying then, for the white man, the intrusion of the black man in his world destructurates his own body, destructurate his own body schema. He's going to react to that, of course, by trying to uh, scandalize the black body itself and make the black body then an object of hatred. No anti-Semite, Fanon goes on to say, for example, would ever conceive of the idea of castrating the Jew. We're getting here now uh, a contrast between uh, the anti-Semite's attitude toward Jews and how he would carry out his hostility toward Jews as against how that hostility would be carried out against the black body itself. No anti-Semite in these states, for example, would ever conceive of the idea of castrating the Jew. He is killed or uh, sterilized, but the Negro is castrated. The penis, the symbol of manhood, is annihilated which is to say that it is denied. The difference between the two attitudes is apparent. The Jew is attacked in his religious identity, in his history, in his race, in his relations with his ancestors and with his posterity. When one sterilizes a Jew, one cuts off the source. Every time that a Jew is persecuted, it is the whole race that is persecuted in his person. But it is in his corporeality that the Negro is attacked. That is, in terms of his, his, his body, in terms of the reality of his body. It is as a concrete personality that he is lynched. It is as an actual being that he is a threat. That is, his mere existence seems to provide a threat to the European. The Jewish menace, Fanon goes on to say, is replaced by the fear of the sexual potency of the Negro. And that's, of course, we imply in the, the last section here that at the bottom of a lot of the fear of the black man, of course, is the fear of his so-called sexual potency. And of course, J.E. Rogers speaks to that very well in his book when he talks about sex and uh, sex and racism. Fanon goes on to talk about, again, about the black body. He is the specialist on this matter. Whoever says rape says Negro. And again, we see this association of the black skin with concept. And, and, of course, it's association with very fearful kinds of thoughts. Let's look again at another quotation by Fanon. Can the white man behave healthily toward the black man? And can the black man behave healthily toward the white man? A pseudo question, some will say. But when we assert that European culture has an imago of the Negro, which is responsible for all of the conflicts that may arise, we do not go beyond reality. That is to say that European culture has an image of the Negro 
uh, using Fanon's term, and it is this image in the psyche of the European mind that is, is the source of the European attitude and behavioral orientation toward the African man. In the chapter on language, we saw that on the screen, the Negro faithfully reproduces that imago. Even serious writers have made themselves its spokesmen. So it was that Michel Cournot could write, the black man's sword is a sword. When he has thrust it into your wife, she has really felt something. <laughs> it is a revelation. In the chasm that it has left, your little toy is lost. <laughs> Pump away until the room is awash with your sweat. You might as well be singing. This is goodbye. Four Negroes with their penises exposed would fill a cathedral. <laughs> they would be unable to leave the building until their erections had subsided. And in such close quarters, that would not be a simple matter. To be comfortable without problems, they always have the open air. But then they, they are faced with the constant insult, the palm tree, the breadfruit tree, and so many other proud growths that would not slacken for an empire, erect as they are for all eternity, and piercing heights that are not easily reached by any price, uh, reached at any price. So again, we see here the sexual image of the black man being projected and being laid as a foundation, of course, for what we would call the Negro phobia. In here, we see a symbolic genetic fear as well. Some of you, of course, are familiar with Francis Welsing's theory uh, that seems to indicate that a part of the, the European attitude toward the African is genetically based and concerns itself with protecting the European so-called genetic inheritance. Fanon goes on to say, one must move softly and there is a whole drama in having to lay bare, little by little, the workings of the processes that are seen in their totality. Will this statement, seen, uh, this statement be susceptible of understanding? In Europe, the black man is the symbol of evil. One must move softly, I know, but it is not easy. The torturer is the black man. Satan is black. One talks of shadows. When one is dirty, one is black whether one is thinking of physical dirtiness or moral dirtiness. It would be astonishing if the trouble were taken to bring them all together, to see the vast number of expressions that make the black man the equivalent of sin. In Europe, whether concretely or symbolically, the black man stands for the bad side of the character. As long as one cannot understand this fact, one is doomed to talk in circles about the black problem. Blackness, darkness, shadow, shades, night, the labyrinths of the earth, abysmal depths, blacken someone's reputation, and on the other side, the bright look of innocence, the white dove of peace, magical, heavenly light. A magnificent blonde child. How much peace there is in that phrase. How much joy. How above all, and above all, how much hope. There is no comparison with a magnificent black child. Literally, such a thing is unwanted. Just the same, I shall go back into the stories of black angels. In Europe, that is to say, in every civilized and civilizing country, the Negro is the symbol of sin, the archetype of the lowest values represented by the Negro. Here again, then, is the imago that uh, Fanon, of course, referred to of late, uh, as, as, as I spoke earlier, that then looks at the black man as symbolizing the, the evil dark side of the personality. The problem with this, of course, is that if it were just left in the European mind, it would not be a problem. But given his economic, political, social, and cultural power, this image is, works itself out upon the, the world and into the environment. 
and ultimately it works itself into the psyche of the, the black man, period. In Europe, Fernandez Negro has one function, that of symbolizing the lower emotions, the baser inclinations, the darker side of the soul. In the collective unconscious of the homo occidentalis, that is the Western man, the Negro, or if one prefers, the color black symbolizes evil, sin, wretchedness, death, war, famine. All birds of prey are black. In Martinique, whose collective unconscious makes it a European country, when a blue Negro, a cold black one, comes to visit, one reacts at once. What bad luck is he bringing? <laughs> and of course, many of us are familiar with that kind of uh, image today. It's very interesting, by the way, I think as you read through this book, and those I know many of you perhaps read it some years ago, and I think though it would be of interest to reread it. Uh, I read it, of course, many years ago, but in preparation for our presentation, uh, in a sense, I've rediscovered it because uh, with, uh, through my own experience and, and work, it has gained a new type of uh, depth for me. But it's, it's interesting when you look at um, the fact that Fanon essentially is writing about the Martinique. Uh, and the Antillian black person. And of course, what he is indicating here to a good extent is that these black people have a collective unconsciousness that pretty much make them perceive themselves as European whites. And he talks about, of course, the psychology of uh, these black Martinicans who still have problems in identifying themselves with the Africanicity. In fact, a friend of mine returned from a, an extensive trip in Africa and made some remarks about his visit, I believe, to Martinique and how I believe he said he was there for about six months or uh, six weeks and uh, did not succeed in uh, attaining a girlfriend there at all. <laughs> and how yet he saw the French soldiers uh, basically uh, treat the, the black woman in any manner uh, they felt free to do. One thing I found very remarkable, I think the French, as Europeans, probably do the best job of brainwashing of any group. Next, I think the English are probably second. The American whites are very crude. And in a way, we kind of have to thank them for their crudeness because uh, admit that, uh, I think to a good degree, American, Afro-Americans' consciousness didn't quite die such a hard death as some of our uh, people colonized by the French. And, and you go over into some of our countries today that were originally colonized by the French, and you will see quite often there that the mind is still colonized today. Uh, the French, of course, it, it, Fanon refers to uh, his chapter on language. And one of the things that the French, I think, convinced this colonized people of was that uh, one could be a Frenchman to the degree that one could speak French very well. And so if uh, you were African and you learned to speak French as the French do, and better than the French do, it made you a Frenchman, a real hoax, a real game. And of course, we see that same kind of tendency in this country as well where we believe learning the language of the master somehow makes us uh, masterful and somehow identifies us with the master. But the French were, were I think, best at this game, where the, the identifying with French man, uh, mannerisms and identifying with the French language was tantamount to becoming a Frenchman oneself. And it becomes interesting to note then those countries often that have fallen under the influence of the French colonizers. Uh, Fanon goes on to say that moral consciousness implies a type of schism, a fracture of consciousness into a bright part and an opposing black part. In order to achieve morality, it is essential that the black, the dark, the Negro, 
vanish from consciousness. So you can see here that black now is being, having been identified with sin and immorality. In order for one to be moral, one then in essence must be white. One must get rid of the African in one's personality. Sort of reminds me of the religious hymns where when one is converted, one is washed as white as snow. And so the uh, white comes to represent uh, morality and to represent all that is good. And black, of course, comes to represent the opposite. Hence, a Negro is forever in combat with his own image. With this kind of imago, then, one being born black is by that very fact born evil and born immoral. And in order for one then to gain a moral stature, one then following the logic of this kind of image, one then must deny one's blackness. And we'll see in a moment um, how Fanon deals with the way some people um, defend themselves against their blackness, particularly if they perceive it as implying immorality. More directly, he goes on to say, each individual has to charge the blame for his baser drive, his impulses to the accounts of an evil genius. Sort of the devil made me do it theory. <laughs> you know, the idea that uh, if one is evil, if one he has base impulses, then it must be the result of the activity of some evil genius that exists outside of oneself. The, uh, and let us look and see then what this evil genius is about to account for an evil genius which is that which is that of the culture to which one belongs, to which he belongs. For instance, we have seen that this is the Negro. This is the collect this collective guilt is born by what is conventionally called the scapegoat. Now the scapegoat for a white society, which is based on the myths of progress, civilization, liberalism, education, enlightenment, refinement, will be precisely the force that opposes the expansion and triumph of these myths. The brutal opposing force is supplied by the Negro. And of course, we see this in everyday life. And we see this in the American system. Some of you may listen to the Bob Grant program. How many of you tune in on that program? Comes on about four <laughs> o'clock there, I believe, uh, on uh, WABC. Otherwise, a, a, a pretty good talk station. <laughs> but uh, and I recommend listening to Grant. Um, I think he, he helps us to confront that element in the American society that we like to deny, and to get a real raw idea of what many people think of the black man and to watch this man refer to, of course, black people as, as animals. And of course, those few blacks who dare to call up, if they're not hung up on or, or insulted, are told to get a job. You know, of course, the assumption is that any black that calls up has no job <laughs> and is not interested uh, in working. And to watch the people who call Grant, it, it becomes, it, it helps uh, us to understand that there is a group of people who are in a sense waiting their turn in America. And when you listen to Bob Grant, you will get a, an inkling of who and what that group is and what they are about. One of the essential things you see in that group and in Grant's uh, statements is the implication that if the black man were not in the midst of America, America would, it, would progress further, America would be more moral, more uh, sane, more enlightened, uh, its educational accomplishments would be greater. In other words, whatever is bad that's happening to America is essentially the result of the presence of black people. When we look at the budget deficit in this country, when we look at the problems that America has economically and socially, politically, with other countries in the world, eventually in the minds of the grants, it works back to the presence of the black man. The country would not be in a deficit if we did not have to feed these lazy black people. 
if we did not have to support social welfare programs, if we did not have these people in our midst, then we could use this money uh, for our own advantage as a people. If we did not have to support them and, and, and their uh, presence in education, then we could educate the white child so that he could compete uh, effectively with the Japanese. So underwriting many of the, the, the issues that Grant discusses with his listeners is a concept that to a good degree, America is in the shape that she is in due to the presence of the black man. And even in whites who do not express this openly as does Grant, this idea lies in the subconscious. And you will see then that when it comes time to so-called deal with the budget, to so-called correct the deficit, it will be corrected on the black, on the backs of black people. The programs that will be repressed and cut out will be those programs that ostensibly are supposed to be there to aid black people. And, and, and this, is often, this often is only apparent because we will see that the white man's charity is rarely, if ever, charity. It too is a part of his domination. As we indicated in our last lecture, everything that this man does, whether it appears to be charitable, and every institution that he has created ultimately concerns itself with maintaining the subordination of the black man. And that includes each institution, whether it is the family institution, the criminal justice institution, the religious institutions, the economic institutions, the educational institutions, and so forth. The end point of all of the goals of those institutions is ultimately to maintain the supremacy of the European. And therefore, all of these so-called services ultimately provided by those institutions will are, are geared toward one end, and that is to maintain the status quo. And consequently, that also includes the white man's charity. If you've read your history, of course, you will recognize that every time in the Old South that the price of cotton went down, the number of blacks lynched went up. We have indicated to you before that integrationism, that assimilationism, can essentially only function on the basis of economic prosperity. And that even if the King, uh, Martin Luther King dream were to come true, it could still perish today that the economic situation in this country were to change. It can only be supported by a prosperous economic system. I indicated to you last week that if it gets to the point where the white man has to make a choice whether to feed his children or your own, he is going to feed his first regardless of civil rights laws and any other kind of laws that you've placed on the books. It will not be done. And therefore, you cannot put your faith in civil rights laws for protecting your interest. You cannot put your faith in the Constitution of the United States. You cannot put your faith in the courts of the United States. All of these things are institutions of the European man and only ultimately support, only uh, operate in supporting his own supremacy. And during times when the assertion of our rights may not be a threat to his dominance, then we may get some semblance of so-called fair play. But at times when the exercising of our rights under this so-called constitution and under the laws of this country threaten the European status in the world, you will see that he will disobey his own laws and break his own laws. So it reminds me of men and laws, right? <laughs> men make the laws and women obey them. <laughs> men make them and are the first ones to break them. And we will see again that this is also the case in terms of the European relative to the African. And the tendency is then that when economic systems begin to falter, when the status of a nation begins to decline, the people in that nation look around for scapegoats. They look around for people to blame. And they look at the economically weakest people 
and the politically weakest people. And it doesn't matter if you held hands with them at some previous point before. It doesn't matter if you lived next door to them at some previous period. It doesn't matter if your children went to school with them at some previous period in time. When the time of decline sets in, the attitudes begin to change and hostility begins to increase. And what was once a dutiful relationship turns ugly and persecution begins to occur. And therefore you must be ever alert then for this possibility. It is during the good times that one should prepare for the bad times. And this is the thing that we often forget. We have been led by leaders who think that once we achieve integration in this country, once little black boys and white girls hold hands together, and once freedom rings throughout the red hills of Georgia, that this shall go on forever. There is no guarantee that tells you that this happy state will exist to the end of time. This is no fairy tale where people live happily ever after. The things do change. Good times do come to an end. And we have been misled then by those leaders who make us assume that once we achieve our so-called civil rights, that once we achieve so-called equality, that once we become a major part of the American mainstream, this will go on forever. There is no law in the universe that tells you that the good times have to go on forever, ladies and gentlemen. There are two words that you must keep in mind, and those two words are integration and disintegration. Disintegration says that which has once at one point been integrated can what? Disintegrate. And while you're talking about integration, then keep the opposite thing in mind. That that which has been joined together can become unraveled. And there are many forces which can lead to its unravelment. When there's a scarcity for bread and food, when there's economic trouble, a beautiful relationship can end. Of course, we have this unrealistic belief in the white man's invulnerability to disaster. We talked last week about religion and the white Jesus. A part of this white Jesus uh, image is that it leads many blacks to think of whites as being blessed in some sort of way, as having some kind of divine mission, as being somewhat more uh, godlike are closer to God than others. It leads to the belief that somehow God is still going to continue to protect this group of people. And therefore, as long as we live among them in protecting themselves, they will protect us by default. There is no law that says that these people will not crumble and fall into the dust. There is no law that says the rain may, has to keep falling in the United States that crops have to keep on producing year after year. We know if we read the books in history very closely, countries that were once prosperous were parched by disaster, by drought, and other kinds of natural disasters. Fertilizers by themselves do not ensure the growth of crops. Tractors by themselves do not ensure the growth of, growth of crops. The existence of Cornell University and other agricultural colleges do not ensure the growth, of the growth of crops. Ultimately, the growth of crops must depend upon the quality of the soil. It must depend upon rainfall. and must depend upon temperature and other climatic events and situations. And as of yet, this white man does not have control of these events. And consequently, if these events change, then they can change the nature of the agricultural situation in this country. It is still quite possible that people in this country can, pay, can face starvation. In some other uh, instances, we've talked about germ warfare. Germ warfare is not only something that may be directed at human beings, but it can most, uh, be most effectively directed at crops, where then a germ can be dropped in, in a field or in a bread basket of a nation and within a season that nation's food system can be destroyed. If that nation cannot get an antidote 
then it can be overrun and be faced with starvation within a matter of a couple of seasons or more. The Russians work on these kind of bacteria. The United States work on this kind of bacteria. Other countries work on this kind of bacteria. Who's to say then that one day we may wake up and find that the corn fields of Iowa and Nebraska and the wheat fields and the other fields upon which our whole social system is built will not be destroyed. Ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, social relations between people is an agricultural function, it is a function of food. And when you change the agriculture, and when you change the food chain, the food chain, you change the relationship between people, and you change attitudes. When the economy changes, attitude changes. So consequently, ladies and gentlemen, then, we must recognize that this European is not invulnerable to the vagaries of the world and to the vagaries of the climate. And consequently, then, we cannot rely on his continuing prosperity forever. We see today in the face of the Japanese, he's beginning to suffer. In the face of other nations and groups, he's beginning to suffer. And therefore, as he suffers, he shall make us suffer. The suffering shall be transferred on to the next man down. We have seen white civilizations rise and fall. We've seen the Greek civilization rise and fall. We've seen the Roman civilizations rise and fall. And there is no law in the world that says the civilizations founded in Western Europe and in the United States will last forever. And consequently, a wise people prepares for that eventuality. And if our reading of history is correct, it is inevitable that at some point the civilization that are led uh, by the white man will take its place among the death heaps and among the dust bins of previous civilizations. And therefore a wise people will not stake its continuing existence on the, the foundation and destiny of these people. But before they let their civilization die, Beware, because they will try to kill you first. Because they will make whoever around them the scapegoats. We saw this, of course, in Germany in relationship to the Jews. When you perhaps will question some Jews in pre-World War II Germany, I'm sure many of them perhaps would have told you if you had told them that the Germans would put them in ovens. No, not our Germans. Our Germans are the most civilized people in the world. They have the best writers in the world. And you look at the great writers, and you see many of them are German. You know, you, you read Goethe and so forth. We have the greatest musicians in the world, Wagner and, and the rest, the greatest poets in the world, the greatest scientific establishment in the world, industrial establishment in the world, people who write very heavily in terms of ethics and morality. But yet, despite all of this quote-unquote civilization, these people ended up in the ovens of Europe. There are those then, I think, in this nation who too find it difficult to conceive of the possibility that these whites will put us in the oven as well. And you must think of that possibility. Do you think they're too civilized, ladies and gentlemen? Well, note, ladies and gentlemen, that civilization and so-called civilized behavior is often only a thin veneer over a very savage mentality. And when that veneer is chipped by economic, social, political, and other kinds of disaster, the savage part of the personality will express itself. And the civilized man of today becomes the murderer of tomorrow. And what I'm saying then, even if this dream of King were to come true, it does not remove from us the responsibility to see to it that we are in a position to protect our interests as people, to develop real power, to develop real cultural cohesion, to act as if the situation were not exactly what it is. 
In the Society of Gentiles, he goes on to read, where the myths are identical with those of the Society of Dijon or Nice, the young Negro identifying himself with the civilizing power will make the nigger the scapegoat of his own moral life. And here again, of course, we see in essence self-hatred, where, as we will talk about in our next lecture, the Negro... The real world challenged my claims. The difficulty in the development of his bodily schema, that is, of, his, of the concept of his body. Living in the world with white people and with white people who perceive us the way they do is going to influence the way we perceive our bodies and the way we relate to our bodies, he is stating here. Consciousness of the body is solely a negating activity. And this, of course, is the point that we were getting at in our last lecture, where when you associate everything black with negativity, then the black child, becoming conscious of his body, engages himself into in acts of negation. And his consciousness then becomes one, and the consciousness of his body becomes one of a consciousness of negation. And the activity of his consciousness becomes a, neg a negating activity. He goes on to say, it is a third person consciousness. The body is surrounded by an atmosphere of certain uncertainty. And of course, uncertainty is a potent source of anxiety. As I was teaching in my classes last week, we were looking at some of the motives that appear to guide the behavior of man and some of the needs which, if they were not fulfilled, became the sources of anxiety. And one of the motives that we noted was the motive for certainty. The need for, for the human being to find certainty and predictability in his world. That need is a very strong one, such that when we exist in an uncertain environment, we also tend to experience fear and anxiety. We tend to experience uh, a sense of disorganization, a sense of breakdown, a, a sense of confusion. And consequently then, we often seek certainty at a, a, at a very high price. One of the major reasons, I believe, that we attach ourselves to religion, particularly to religions that are irrational, that are illogical, that are not based on any solid evidence. And it beats me as to why God must be irrational, why God must abrogate his own laws, the laws that he has made. We go into our classroom and we study the laws of physics and we see that the laws work very perfectly and predictably. And yet when it comes to religion, all of a sudden the laws created by God don't count anymore. God is irrational. He is beyond his own law. He spits in the very face of the laws with which we created the universe. This is what many religions would have us believe. That to believe in God is to throw away logic, is to throw away reality, is to throw away law, and to take a dive into the irrational, into the crazy, into the unbelievable. And the more irrational and mythological the more fantastic and bizarre, the more we hang on to these religions. <laughs> I often challenge my class and say, if a woman walked in here today and told you that she was pregnant and was never touched by a man, was never artificially inseminated, 
never had anything to do with the man, and yet she's fully pregnant. Would you believe her? Nah. I would say she'd have to be in touch. Well, suppose she told you that she was impregnated by God. Oh, no, she would be crazy. She would be out of her mind. I know I'm stepping on some toes here, ladies and gentlemen, but let's confront it. But then let somebody sing a little music. <laughs> let somebody create a little oratory. And you believe any crazy thing. You believe any unscientific thing. And this is what religions do. Many of them, not religions, I'm talking about the false ones. That hypnotize through rhythm. That hypnotize through oratory. That hypnotize through group influence, one on the other. If all of these people believe it, who am I not to believe it? <laughs> if I got a thousand people believing this, then I must be the one who's wrong. And we talk about it in psychology, social influence, you see. How people will not believe something that is obvious in front of their eyes if two or three other people will believe something else or state that they believe something else. In fact, if you really want to get people attached to a cult, say something and make your ideology as bizarre and crazy <laughs> as possible. So that when they believe it, they have to be totally committed to it. So when they believe it, they have to cut their minds off to logic. You see? And what is this about? Why do we so firmly believe these kinds of things? And why is it that we find these religions often in all kinds of cultures, you see, ladies and gentlemen? It has to do with the motive for certainty, the need for the world to be predictable. Because uncertainty makes us fearful, makes us nervous, threatens us with disorganization, makes us wonder what is going to happen next and not be able to prepare for the next happening. So, in comes a mythology that tells us and purports to tell us why the world was created. And you'll see this in every culture. Why we are here on earth. What is our purpose for existing in the world? They purport to tell us what life really means. And most of all, they purport to tell us what will happen after we die. <laughs> See? And that one frightens us a whole lot, you see. <laughs> what is going to happen when I die? And so in comes somebody that says, I know what's going to happen to you after you die. <laughs> you know? That, that relaxes us. Oh, you do. All right. You know, tell me, well, there is this place and that place and so and so and so and so. Ladies and gentlemen, these mythologies, you see, uh, serve very important psychological functions. Very important. Not only religious mythologies, but political ones, too. One day, that will be the great classless society. A lot of people fall for that one, too, you know. Gives them purpose and direction. But one of the things often that it does, it gives them meaning in their lives, you know. But often these Many of these religious structures are death philosophies. Often I've stated, in order for a person to really think about how he should live his life and enjoy life and get a sense of what life is about, he should meditate on death and what death represents. Because often what you think of death and how you perceive death and how you perceive what is going to happen to you after death has a major influence on how you live your life. It's very important. If you really want to think about and change life, look at death. And often many of us don't think about it consciously, but we still have an unconscious attitude toward death, and that unconscious attitude manipulates us. So when the Christian, and I'm just using the Christian, but this is true of other uh, groups as well, and I'm using Christian because that's the religion I'm most uh, familiar with, but certainly the others have the same basic orientation of talking about what is going to happen after death. Not only do they tell us what's going to happen after death, they give us some options. <laughs> says, well, there are two places, heaven and hell. And no, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not saying there's not, but I'm speaking to the essence of the idea. 
So don't get me wrong and get too upset here. But I'm, I'm talking about the essence of something. There's heaven and there's hell. There's a hell plan and there's a heaven plan. Which way do you want to go? <laughs> if you live, if you want to go to heaven, then you got to live in such and such and such a way. You got to relate to other people in such and such a way. You got to talk and walk and all of these other things in such and such a way. So consequently now, the individual will live his current life in terms of what he thinks is going to happen to him after he dies. In a sense, he doesn't live in the world as it is. He lives in the world of the dead. And his life is focused and based on a death philosophy. In a sense, he moves through the world without ever really knowing what it's all about. Because he never deals with it in terms of his isness. He deals with it in terms of some particular phase that's coming on the future. I said, how many Christians are going to be disappointed if after they die, they find out that there's no heaven or no hell? <laughs> there's going to be some raising of hell, you can believe that. <laughs> You mean to tell me I skip all those parties, man? You, you better get me to have it up here. <laughs> I have not given up all these sacrifices just for you to tell me that there's no heaven around. Think of how much people's life would change if they could really be could really could be convinced that there was no such thing as heaven and hell. I'd hate to think of the changes, <laughs> but what fantastic changes would be made, for better or worse. I'm not saying they would be better, it might be worse. But just think of the idea of what would happen if people were really convinced that there was no heaven and no hell. How much would you change your own personal life? <laughs> How much would your attitudes change? Quite drastically. With and what are we saying here then? That the religions, uh, 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 we attach ourselves to religions very powerfully because, to a good extent, they help us to deal with uncertainty. They reduce our anxiety. They provide relief. They provide us with a sense of meaning and purpose. It does not matter if they are illogical. It does not matter if they run into the face of science. It does not matter if they negate the very laws of God as represented in physics and, and chemistry and science and technology. That is not the point. The point is, for the believer, is that by believing this, I feel better. And I want this good feeling to go on, and I'm not going to let your logic or reason or law take it away from me. Because, you see, even if I were to believe your logic, you're still now going to leave me with anxiety because I'm going to still be troubled about why am I here? Where must I go? What end am I headed for? Why is the world the way it is and why does it exist? And if you destroy what I believe in in terms of your logic, you still would not be able to provide me with a relief. And so consequently we see the kinds of problems that exist today. So I'm talking about this concept of uncertainty and how then the existence of uncertainty often motivates people to believe in things that quite often in many instances can be bizarre, irrational, and illogical. And then when you make then the black skin and the black body the focus of uncertainty, it strongly motivates uh, those of us in that body to seek certainty. And we will seek certainty even at the price of believing mythologies and believing bizarre things and ideas at the price of becoming irrational if being irrational will assuage our anxieties. And this is a sense, ladies and gentlemen, this is in a sense the way I have stated many of us are literally made crazy. Because in a sense to be crazy is to live and dwell in the irrational. He goes on to say, I know that if I want to smoke, I shall have to reach out my right arm and take the pack of cigarettes lying at the other end of the table. The matches, however, are in the drawer on the left. I shall have to lean back slightly. And all these movements are made not out of habit, but out of implicit knowledge. A slow composition of myself 
he puts this in italics, as a body in the middle of a spatial and temporal world, which seems to be the schema. It does not impose itself on me. It is rather a definitive structuring of the self and of the world. Definitive because it creates a real dialectic between my body and the world. In developmental psychology, we talk about how the child gets to gain a sense of self and a sense of its body. To gain a sense of one's body is a developmental uh, event. And one gains a sense of body through what um, Fanon refers here, through a dialectic with one's body and the world. And you will see in the very first months of life, the child coordinating its body with its body, coordinating its hands and its, and its mouth, coordinating its eyes and its hand. In a sense, it begins to get a knowledge of its body and its body composition by interacting with different parts of its own body and, the ga and gaining mental control over the movements of its body. During the next few phases, it, get a, it gets a deeper sense of its body by playing with objects. As we often say, child's play is work. It is not a game. Child's play is a learning activity. It is of exceeding importance. As the child plays with objects, it learns physics lessons. As it rolls objects and throws objects and shapes, shakes objects, as it walks around objects, as it runs into objects, as it pushes objects, as it views a spatial environment, it gets to know its position as a body in a world of bodies. It gets a sense of space. It gets a sense of time, of tra trajectory. It is then beginning to establish its body, in, uh, its body image and get a sense of its limitation, a sense of where its body begins and ends and where the world begins and ends. It gets a sense of the me and the not me, a sense of itself as object and a sense of the other as object. It is through the interaction then with its environment, with an environment of objects, that the child comes to know its own body as an object, that it trains its body to move in a world of objects. And this then is what Fanon is talking about, that, uh, that he could learn this self as a result of a dialectic with the world. However, there is going to be another kind of interaction that is going to imp impose itself on his, his concept of his body and on his schema for his body. For several years, he goes on to say, certain laboratories have been trying to produce a serum for the denigrification, that is for denigrification. <laughs> and how many people dream of that one? <laughs> With all the earnestness in the world, the laboratories have sterilized their test tubes, checked their scales, embarked on researches that might make it possible for the miserable Negro to whiten himself and thus throw off the burden of that corporal malediction. Below the corporal schema, I sketch a historical racial schema. In other words, below the, the, the physical schema of his body, the physical image of his body that he would get to know through interaction with the world and with objects in the world, lies another schema or outline or body image, and that is the historical racial schema that is imposed in upon the black body image by the presence of the European. He goes on to say the elements that I use had been provided for me not by residual sensations and perceptions, primarily of a tactile, vestibular, kinesthetic, and visual character. He's stating here then that the image that he is going to get of his body is not merely the result of the sensations he experienced since when he feels the world, when he uh, moves in the world, and when he sees the world, and when he hears the world, there is also going to be another basis for his perception of his body. But by the other, the white man, who had woven me out of a thousand details, anecdotes, stories, I thought that what I had in hand was to construct a physiological self, to balance space, to localize sensations, 
and here I was called on for more. So then what, we, what we're indicating here, on top of getting to know the physiological body, the black man then must get to know a historical body, a social body that is imposed by social historical circumstances. And he goes on, it was, I was responsible at the same time for my body, for my race, for my ancestors, I subjected myself to an objective examination, I discovered my blackness, my ethnic characteristics, I was battered down by tom-toms, cannibalism, intellectual deficiency, fetishism, racial defects, slave ships, and above all else, above all, show good eating. On that day, completely dislocated, unable to be abroad with the others, the white man who unmercifully imprisoned me, I took myself far off from my own presence. Far indeed, and made myself an object. But what else could it be for me but an amputation, an exism, a hemorrhage that splattered my whole body with black blood? But I did not want this revision, this thematization. All I wanted was to be a man among other men. I wanted to come wanted to come life, lit and young into a world that was ours to help, was ours and to help to build it together. My body was given back to me, sprawled out, distorted, recolored, clad in mourning in that white winter day. He's talking about the day he was uh, uh, <clears throat> insulted by a white couple. The Negro is an animal. The Negro is bad. The Negro is mean. The Negro is ugly. Look, a nigger is cold. The nigger is shivering. The nigger is shivering because he is cold. The little boy is trembling because he is afraid of the nigger. The nigger is shivering with cold. That cold goes through your bones. The handsome little boy is trembling because he thinks the nigger is quivering with rage. The little white boy throws himself into his mother's arms. Mama, the nigger's going to eat me up. <laughs> on and on. And on. We go and we have to cut the quotations of um, Fanon here, but I want you to, to look at this uh, particular book more closely because I think he, in a very phenomenological way, gets at the conscious and unconscious um, situation in terms of the black psyche and how this psyche has been imposed upon the, the black men uh, by his uh, European captors. I want to switch your attention for a moment to uh, an area uh, that we call conditioning. How is it that that this self-hatred is induced? I quoted to you last week from one of uh, the introductions to psychology books, indicating how those books, in a way, state very clearly, if you're capable of understanding the code, how the black man has been created by the European. But you know, there's a statement that says, or at least some kind of thing that, that goes, that if you want to hide something, something from a black man, put it in print. <laughs> and it becomes interesting then that we see the arrogance of the white man who puts the very methods and means by which he creates the black man and maintains control of the world in print and puts it before our very faces. And we go to college and read it and miss the whole point. A very effective kind of method. So that you can say, oh, I'm not denying you anything. You can go to the library, reread the same books <laughs> I read. A bogus kind of freedom, you see. <laughs> that says, though, after I have robbed you of the ability to decode my hieroglyphics, then I will expose those hieroglyphics to you and say that you, were free to, you are free to read them. And if you don't understand them, it is your fault, not my own. You cannot accuse me of being like the Russians, holding back information. And the fact that you have the book before you and you don't understand the book must be a result of your own innate dumbness. Right. Not of my own censorship. What an insult. 
And yet many of us go to colleges and schools and we read these books. I talk about the black child. Some of you are familiar with that child. Born in advance of the white child in its development in many areas. And yet we see that, white, that black child falling behind the white child at the point where language becomes the chief instrument for dealing with the world. When we talk about IQ differences between black and white people and children and so forth, essentially that, dif that difference centers around the difference in vocabulary and the ability to use words. Ladies and gentlemen, people, men all over the world, regardless of culture, speak a language, which means that the word is of essential importance to human existence and survival. It, the human being and the human brain is biologically designed to create symbols, cause words, and use words. You see in the Bible that God creates in terms of the word and the symbol. And man creates in terms of the word and the symbol. And people who are incompetent in dealing with the word and the symbol are people who are incompetent in ensuring their survival. And consequently, you will see those in power will try to impose that incompetency upon us. You read the incident of Frederick Douglass when he realized the importance of the word, and many of you are familiar with that where the wife of a slave owner, his slave owner, started teaching him to read. And the, and the master came in and uh, chided her and attacked her for doing so. And he literally said, can't you see if you teach this person to read that you are going to ruin a good slave? And Douglas, overhearing that, understood very clearly as he said, the key to the whole thing. That if you are to make a slave, in a sense, then you have to make him dumb. That you, ha you have to rob him of linguistic and symbolic skills and of thinking skills. And so you see a situation that is still the case today. This is a very slick system. It robs one of the capacity to decode the language and then it leaves you free to read. <laughs> and you'll see that kind of thing is going to run throughout the system. And, I'm going, and I often say that we have a freedom in this civilization, if you call it that, but we only have the freedom to do wrong, not the freedom to do right. And the freedom is given after the brainwashing has occurred so that you will choose the wrong thing of your own free will. So that we will put the libraries in your community and you will say, I just don't feel like going over there to read. <laughs> and you will say, I'm free because I can go or not go if I feel like it. No, you're not free. I can read if I want to. If I don't want to read, then I won't read. That indicates my freedom. That is a lie. You're not free because you do what you want to do. Because, ladies and gentlemen, what you want to do has also been artificially implanted in your mind. And during the period of slavery and reconstruction, the desire not to read and understand the word has been in, was implanted into the minds of the black man. So that when you put a book before his face, he experiences a, a, a lack of desire to read and think that that lack of desire is an expression of his freedom of choice. Because he is not familiar with the original implantation of that lack of desire. And this is the way the system is designed, you see. And this is the setup for self-destruction, you see. You will destroy yourself thinking that you're expressing your own freedom. And watch our behavior. It goes that way. 
Reminds me of the black man who asked me one day, what shall I do? My daughter is persecuted by my white neighbors. I'm the only Negro in the, in the, in the neighborhood. Give me some solution. <laughs> Someone in all you said, move. <laughs> That's the solution. Get out. Why, why expose your daughter to, to an insult day in and day out like that? But of course his retort would be and was, I'm free. I have a right to live where I feel like living. I have equality. I'm not going to let these people, you know, abridge my freedom by leaving. A very noble kind of statement, isn't it? <laughs> and one that has a certain validity to it. It sounds righteous at first. <laughs> but notice, and you look at your behavior very closely, almost every time we as black people express our freedom, it almost always will lead us toward the support of the white man to buying his houses, to buying his land and giving him the money, to supporting his stores. We express our freedom for the lunch counter by buying the white man's wieners <laughs> and buying the white man's coffee. And therefore it's a system that will make us feel freest when we are most enslaved and make us think of our enslavement as the essence of freedom. We think that we are equal to a white man when we buy a house in the same neighborhood as a white man slavery. Oh, you say it's the same act. He buys a house, I buy a house next door to him. Aren't we doing the same thing? Doesn't have the same effects though. He buys from his white realtor. And therefore his money is circulated when he shops for grocery, he buys it from his white grocer. His brain is contributed to his white community. His energy and whatever else he does goes into that community. We've indicated that the buying of a house is not just the buying of a house, it's buying of a neighborhood. There's a lot that goes into it. And therefore, when you buy that same kind of house, where is your money going? Is it going to a black realtor? Is it going to a black grocery store? With your great intelligence, are you going to use that now to, for black people? Or are you going to be down at that white school helping to support it as a part of your integration into the neighborhood? The same act by people existing in two different stratas of a society has different effects. And therefore you cannot just look at the acts that people perform in terms of equality. You must look at the effects of their acts. And see, often the assimilationist Negro looks at acts and assumes that if he acts in the same way as a white man, he therefore is equal. But if he looked more closely, he'd recognize that his act is an act of destruction. And the white man's act, though it is the same superficially, is an act of conserving or construction. Be careful then that people in expressing their freedom will only build chains for themselves. And we see this kind of thing going on. Let's look quickly at this. So what we've been talking about is, is essentially summed up in the conditioning, what we call the conditioning paradigms. Some of you are familiar with the Pavlovian dog, right, and how you, how you get this dog to respond to certain stimuli. The classical experiment is one where uh, you put a dog in the harness and you can measure its salivation uh, as, a, as a part of a reflex reaction to uh, stimuli of various types. You uh, ring a bell, let us say, and then you present the dog with food. And the dog, of course, salivates as the process of eating the food. And over time, you ring the bell to present food, and the dog salivates uh, uh, as a part of, of eating the food. And you do this over a number of times. After a while, all you have to do is ring the bell, and the dog salivates. The dog now is responding to the, the bell as if it were food. Let's look at this, though, initially. When you have uh, classical conditioning, what you're essentially doing uh, is associating two stimuli together. One of the stimuli is what we call neutral. It has no meaning. It is what it is. Before this classical experiment, the bell was just a sound. That's all. Nothing but a sound. 
It was exactly what it was, signifying nothing but noise. That's all, as far as the animal was concerned. It was neutral and meaningless. But then when you ring the bell and present the food with it, it was neutral and meaningless. But then when you ring the bell and present the food with it, and you keep doing this again and again, the bell achieves meaning. It becomes a dinner bell. <laughs> it becomes a sound. Now it, 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 it achieves meaning in the world of the dog. It is no longer neutral. But it is really still what it is, isn't it? But because these things have been associated one with the other, the bell now is transformed in the brain of the dog. But not only is the image of the bell transformed, the dog too has become transformed in the process. And meaning is brought into the world. And consequently now you ring the bell and you get a dog emitting a response that before it would not have emitted at all. And would have emitted only to food. Now all you got to do is make a sound and its mouth start watering. This is in essence the classical Pavlovian experiment. And it's a very interesting kind of, of experiment. We'll come back to it in a minute. We have another instance and it, uh, let's look at it uh, from a certain point of view. A neutral stimulus then, a stimulus without meaning, if it is paired enough with a stimulus that has meaning, that creates a natural reaction, such as, uh, as we indicated, uh, a penitive reaction, such as salivation, or if it creates a natural reaction such as fear, or anxiety, or desire, or uh, a, a desire to satisfy oneself. If you associate then an originally neutral, meaningless stimulus with this kind of emotional reaction or with a stimulus that creates this kind of emotional reaction, then the meaningless stimulus gains the power to evoke the reactions itself that the other stimulus evoked naturally. How is this done then in terms of race relations? Every time you see white, associated it with it is what? Good. White, beauty. White, intelligence. White, civilization. White, morality. And everywhere you look, radio, TV, billboard, magazine, newspaper, everywhere, the Pavlovian message flashes. White, good. White, good. White, good. White, good. White, good. White, good. White, smart. White, smart. White, smart. White, smart. White, smart. Smart. White. It goes the other way around. After a while, when you think of the good, the next thing that comes to your mind, white. Intelligent. White. Civilized. White. Moral. White. Power. White. Wealth. White. Good hair. White. <laughs> anyway, white. The conditioning has what? Occurred. A very simple paradigm, isn't it? Just keep associating. Keep associating. And, and, and the individual will have a natural, instinctual response. The response will become automatic. In fact, it will become so automatic until the individual often will not even be able to control the reaction consciously. The dog, after you condition him, once you flash that light, the salivation just flows right out. Nothing you can do about it. It just comes right out. <laughs> and you can see then people subjected to four and five hundred years of that kind of conditioning. And who are conditioned in this way 24 hours a day, seven days a week, are going to then build into themselves an attitude toward white. God! White! <laughs> Jesus, white. The Bible never described Jesus as white at all. In no way. And yet when you, but yet every time you walk into that church, that Pavlovian conditioning takes place. Jesus, white. God, white. Good, white. 
divinity, white. You open that Sunday school book and there's old white, blonde, blue-eyed Jesus in that, in that book. Religion, white. Again and again and again and again. And if you get an image of the devil, what do you get? Black, dark, color. One way or the other. Simple paradigm, ladies and gentlemen. But if you don't, if you read, you don't read these books correctly, you get miseducated. There was another method related to this classical condition we call reflexology. In this instance, what you do is 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 harness the dog and you flash the light or something like that. You can show it anything. And each time you flash the light or ring the bell, you shock its hind feet. So then the natural reaction is for the dog to flex its muscles. So you flash the light and it, it turn on the juice and it jumps, you see. So after a while, you don't even turn on the juice, you just flash the light, zinc. <laughs> Now, the reflex should be something that occurs to a natural event, right? The light is not shocking the dog, but the dog is shocked nevertheless, <laughs> or it acts as if it is shocked. Here again it is where you are connecting what? Pain with an image, you see. And here again you're conditioning a particular kind of reaction to an image. And it reminds you again of what we've been talking about earlier here tonight. Black, dirty. Black, filthy. Black, dumb. Black, rape. Black, lust. Black, murder. Black, this. Over and over again, 24 hours a day, 400 years, 7 days a week. Time after time after time. So that the individual instinctively reacts to his blackness with withdrawal and, with, and, and reflexively. But does blackness have anything to do with it, ladies and gentlemen? Not at all. You see, often we forget. You know, I like this description. I like this phase, uh, this area of the Bible, where Moses supposedly asked God, who shall I tell them you are? Right, and you remember that? And what, how does God answer him? I am that I am. That's all he said. Now this is directly from the mouth of God, I'm told. Right? He didn't say, I'm the lily of the valley under the bright and morning star. Did he? He says what? I am that I am. I just what? Am. And he impresses on Moses his isness, his beingness in the world. And it's very important because you would recognize religious people start chopping and killing each other up when they start adding to the attributes of God. His name is, how dare you call him anything else? <laughs> you know, he has this quality. No, he has that quality. And now they fight and kill each other over what? Names and attributes. And what is God saying? I am that I am. Because he knows that when you start adding names and adding attributes, which more than likely work to your advantage, of course, <laughs> you're going to start creating trouble. And people who then start getting into this kind of game. And often this very naming and adding of attributes alienates the individual from God because they cannot experience God directly in his amnesty and in his being. They must filter their relationship through some doctrinal names invented by other men and some attributes invented by other men instead of having a direct contact and relationship with God. That's why I said last week often the church will lead you to hell because often it imposes its doctrines and its additions and attributes between the member and God itself. And though the member believes in the attributes, the very belief in the attributes themselves will often block them from a direct relationship with God and a direct learning of God. And what am I getting at here then? The refusal of man often to accept the isness of reality. There is no foot in the world, ladies and gentlemen. There are no miles in the world, are there? Are there any ups and downs, lefts or rights? 
those are things that we what? We create and impose upon the world, but we ought to forget that, you know. The world, what? Is. It is what it is, what it is, what it is. What it is. But what do we do? We come in and we judge it. We put values on it. And once we start judging it and putting values on it, we start becoming victimized by our judgments. Reminds me of another statement there. It said what? Judge not that ye be not judged, you see? And I like to think of it in terms of prejudgment, where people run and they prejudge and pre-symbolize, and then they react not to the thing itself, but what? To their symbolization of the thing itself. Black skin is black skin is black skin is black skin. That's all it is. That's all it was. That's all it'll ever be. That's it in its reality. But then what happens to us? That's why I said last week, often the church will lead you to hell because often it imposes its doctrines and its additions and attributes between the member and God itself. And though the member believes in the attributes, the very belief in the attributes themselves will often block them from a direct relationship with God and a direct learning of God. And what am I getting at here then? The refusal of man often to accept the isness of reality. There is no foot in the world, ladies and gentlemen. There are no miles in the world, are there? Are there any ups and downs, lefts or rights? Those are things that we what? We create and impose upon the world, but we ought to forget that, you know. The world what is. It is what it is, what it is, what it is, what it is. But what do we do? We come in and we judge it. We put values on it. And once we start judging it and putting values on it, we start becoming victimized by our judgments. Reminds me of another statement there. It said what? Judge not that you be not judged, you see? And I like to think of it in terms of prejudgment, where people run and they prejudge and pre-symbolize, and then they react not to the thing itself, but what? To their symbolization of the thing itself. Black skin is black skin is black skin is black skin. That's all it is. That's all it was. That's all it'll ever be. That's it in its reality. But then what happens to us? You make it what? Represent, as the European does, what? Dominus, represent that, represent this, represents the other thing. And those other things that is made to represent create a reaction, an emotional reaction, a, a, a kind of relationship. And therefore, an individual, when he accepts these European definitions, then becomes conditioned and reacts to his own skin, and yet the skin is only there, isn't it? It's just only there. The skin is not hurting anybody. It's not causing any pain. It exists, but the person acts of this as if it is the problem. You're like this because I'm black. You're not no. suffering anything because you're black. Okay. You're suffering it as the result of the fact that some other person is putting a hurt on you. The dog reacts to the light because the experimenter has set it up that way. Even though the dog may think it is a light that causes his leg to go up. No such thing. But when you condition people, they also think, oh, it is because I'm black. 
because I'm African, because of my body, that I have this feeling, that I have this relationship. Then when that gets the case, you're taken in. Look at Adam and Eve, that vaunted myth that we read. <laughs> Look at it. Very instructive. The Bible is very, very instructive. One of the best books of psychology you ever read. Perhaps one of the best. Yeah. But too often it is not it is it is misused and abused by those who would purport to be religious leaders. And often it is not used to give man a deeper insight into himself and a philosophical outlook at life, you see. So here we have Adam and Eve in the garden, in their innocence, in their isness and beingness. And in that isness and beingness, where they haven't prejudged everything, right? They haven't divided the world yet up into bad and good and good and evil, have they? They're just in the garden enjoying themselves. <laughs> they walk around naked. Adam looks at Eve not with lust, because she's in the illness. There's no reason why you have to look at a naked woman with lust. You don't have to in pure nature look at it that way. How many of us, when we look back at our African past, wonder how is it that our forefathers could have been around with each other virtually naked? And some naked. What a state of mind they must have been in to be able to do that. I mean, a fantastic state of mind. And yet we let a woman put on some short pants or something, we're ready to rape her now in this culture. It used to be if she just showed her ankle, she was in trouble. <laughs> what kind of world is this? In any case, the man does not have to be naturally rapacious and lusty when he sees a woman without clothing. It, it, this has been shown to be the case in our own experience as African people. And symbolically in the Eve myth, you see that. Because man is in his isness and living in the present in a state of innocence. You see? And, and things are what they are. Eve is naked, Adam is naked, and that's accepted for what it is. That's what it is. It doesn't have to mean, oh, she's out to get me <laughs> or seduce me. <laughs> but note what happens. God tells them what? If you eat of the tree of the what? Of knowledge of good and evil, you're going to be in trouble. Right? You're going to be in trouble. And the old devil tells them, hey, eat of it because you should be as gods. Trouble. What happened? They eat of it. And now they're able to look at the world in terms of what? Good and evil. Bad and good. Now they judge it. And as soon as they are able to judge it, they experience shame and guilt. They have to hide their bodies one from the other. They look at each other now in lust and, and the other thing. And guilt now it comes into the world. And with guilt coming into the world, with shame coming into the world, with hierarchy coming into the world, where some are high and others are low, where some are good and others are bad, comes murder, comes death, comes destruction. And this is the name of the game, ladies and gentlemen. And it was only where it was the only duty of God, and God only had the capacity to judge. Now man has the capacity to judge. And because he judges, he feels like he's a what? A God. And because he gets himself in a position to say what is good and what is bad, what is right and what is wrong, he also thinks then that he's not only in the position to judge, but he's in the position to punish and to destroy in the name of his judgments. And this is a part of the godlike nature, this pseudo-godlike nature of the European man. He thinks now that since we as people have let him have this power to judge, to name, to evaluate, that power then has led him to abuse us as people, to associate blackness with evil and with terrible things, and to associate whiteness with goodness and other kinds of things, and to therefore relate to us in terms of his judgments and to act toward us as if he is some kind of God. And therefore, acting like a God, he then, like the Old Testament God, punishes, slays, and destroys. And this is what you see happening in that experiment there. 
a neutral, innocent, existent stimulus becomes now a subject of judgment and uh, symbolizes something. And once it, it, is, it, is, it is done that way in the dog's psyche or in its brain, it relates to that, that symbol now in a way it never related before. This is why I told you last week, you have to remove from the European this power of naming and defining. And you have to remove from ourselves this tendency to accept the world the way he names and defines it. Because with his increasing ability to name and define it has come the increasing death and destruction of black people. Has come the destruction of the African nation and of African people. And this is, this is evidenced in, the, uh, in these conditioning experiments. You will see another part of conditioning is what we call negative reinforcement. In other words, in the Pavlovian experiment, you get the animal to behave the way you want to by giving it food or by giving it something it likes. But another way you can get the animal to behave is by relieving it from pain, you see? By saying, you can put a person in pain and say, okay, I'll let you up if you do such and such. And this is what we call negative reinforcement, you see? And uh, this is a method that's used as well in the conditioning. If you forget that you are black, if you escape your blackness, if you deny your blackness, then you get relief. <laughs> you see? And that uses the setup. If you identify with your blackness, you experience what? Pain, discomfort, guilt, self-doubt, self-hate, and all that other thing. This is the result of the original what? Association, you see? And therefore, the individual is motivated to move the other way. And we shall talk in the next lecture about how this basic conditioning situation is going to lead the black man to identify with his enemy. And how it leads the sick individual to identify with his very destroyer. You see, because he is going to try to escape the original associated relationship that has been established by his destroyer. I'm going to associate blackness with pain, he says, and with dirtiness and so forth. And therefore, since you react negatively to these things, you're going to react negatively to your own body and to your own skin. And therefore, the only other alternative for you is to act white, but that's made impossible as well. There's another paradigm we call operant conditioning. In operant conditioning, the, the, the essential rule of operant conditioning is that behavior is controlled by its consequences. Fundamentally, it means that if you behave in a certain way that brings pleasure and satisfaction, there is, uh, there, you'll have a greater tendency to behave in the same way in the future, which is quite logical. Nothing heavy about it. <laughs> Very simple, isn't it? Yeah. If doing and making a certain move is going to bring you what you want, then each time you want it, you make the move. If it brings pain and hurt, you don't do it. This is the essence of power, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. The ability to control consequences. And this is why a man wants power. And this is why the white man as a minority needs power. The essence of power is the ability to reward and punish. So that you can say, if you behave in this way, then I'll give you this. If you behave in the other way, I'll give you that. If you behave in the way I want you to, I'll give you a reward or some kind of relief. Or I won't let you suffer quite as much. <laughs> okay. But if you behave in the other way, you shall feel pain. And this is what happens to the animal in the Skinner box we talked about last week. If the animal does it in one way, the, the, the uh, experimenter shoots the juice to him. So he starts behaving in that way. If he behaves in the other way, he gets food. He gets something to eat. So you can see then his behavior being manipulated in terms of reward and punishment. This is the reason why I tell people you should look at the conditioning, operant conditioning, our so-called Skinnerian conditioning, in terms of a power relationship that exists between the animal and the experimenter. Where the experimenter, because he can control the consequences of that animal behavior, ultimately ends up creating the behavior in the animal and creating the animal so that it can behave the way the experimenter wants it to behave. When you let then another people have control 
of the consequences, then they will have control of your creation. When we let this right man control 60, 70, and 80 percent of the world's wealth and control economic and political empires, then it is not merely a matter of racial discrimination, it is a matter of racial creation. Because these gifts and punishments will be handed out in such a way that the character of the oppressed people will be changed and transformed and created to suit the purposes of the European or the person who is in control. And you see this in the essence of these conditioning experiments, you see. It is only when we as a people can get into a position to control the consequences of our own behavior that we can become self-creating. And ultimately then it lets us know, ladies and gentlemen, that we are not only in a struggle of being treated fairly, of being dealt with kindly by the white man, we are in a struggle for power the power to have control over consequences. Because that is the only way we can defend our interest and that is the only way we can create ourselves the way we want to be as people. We have black people who wonder about black children today. They shake their heads but look, and they look at these children as they behave on the subways and other places in the street and wonder why they behave the way they do. But, ladies and gentlemen, when you send your children to the enemy to educate them, how do you expect them to behave? The white man is not going to educate your children to overthrow his power in the world. You're dreaming when you think that is going to happen. That is the silliest and craziest idea that has ever been imposed upon black people. That the white man is going to educate the black man to assume equality with himself. Because ultimately, equality with the white man, he knows in the depths of his heart, represents his end and his destruction. And yet we have some black people who express alarm and shock when their children coming out from under these teachers and out of this educational system are not behaving the way they think they should behave in terms of the survival of the world. The only way that you can assure that they're going to behave the way they're supposed to behave is what? To teach them yourself. To be in control of the rewards and to be in control of the punishments. To manipulate the rewards and punishments so as to create in them the kind of character you need for them to have for your own interest. Because if you leave the power to manipulate reward and punishment in the hands of another people, they're going to manipulate them in such a way that they're going to create them to their advantage and not to your own. We have to face up for that. And that means that we have to gain the power, not morality, not moral suasion, as some people talked about so eloquently some years back, but power. How do you persuade the people who've demonstrated throughout history their devilish nature and their willingness to destroy anyone who got in the way of their domination? You think that these people are going to be persuaded merely by their own so-called religion? You have another thought coming. <laughs> their religion was one of their greatest instruments of aggression and laid the foundations for their rationalization of slavery itself. And to think then that you're going to use this instrument, which was the source of their domination, to gain some kind of equality with them is, going, is, is, is nonsense. We have another thing called an aversive at, uh, conditioning. In this kind of conditioning, you, 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 uh, let's, let's look at about uh, three types here right quick. You can have what we call conditioned, um, conditioned emotions, let us say. That is, for instance, if you had a, a light and you put an animal in a box with the light and with a, a floor that you can electrify, and each time you turn on the light, you turn on the juice, the animal not only has a, a physical reaction, but he has an emotional reaction. Squeals, jumps around, defecates, urinates, and, you know, just uh, generally uh, carries on indicative of the emotional 
expression of that particular animal. You keep that up over time, when you flash that light then alone without turning on the electricity, it will still express itself emotionally. And in that sense it has become emotionally conditioned. So in a sense when you look at the racial paradigm, when you, uh, when you associate black with negativity, when you punish black people for assembling together, when you punish them for loving one another and being together, when you punish them for cohesive action and collective action, when you punish them for admiring who and what they are and for loving themselves as, the, as themselves, then after a while you, 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 you make them emotionally responsive to their own color and you make them negative, you respond to their own color and their own being uh, in, a, in a negative sort of way. And this, of course, is the plan. This is why history is rewritten this is why every attribute of the black man is correlated supposedly with some psychological attribute. So that the emotional reactions we give to a particular psychological attribute is the same kind of reaction we give to our blackness as persons. This then lays the basis for alienation, for the desire to escape from our very bodies. What a dilemma we are in then if the thing we wish to escape from is us ourselves. The very vehicle for our being on earth becomes an instrument of horror and an instrument of fear. The very essence of neurosis and psychosis is alienation and a split in the personality. As a matter of fact, psychologists and psychiatrists used to be called alienists. People who dealt with people who were alienated and cut off from themselves. And when you cut a person off from, him, from himself, then you have prescribed madness for that individual. That is why often I say, for us to exist in this European world, we literally have to be crazy. And the process is done through these kinds of paradigms. You can create a, a, another kind of conditioning, the condition that we might call escape conditioning. We'll talk about this in, in a real form in the next lecture where you electrocute the animal, but you permit it to escape, you see. So as soon as it uh, feels a little anxiety about something, it runs away from that particular something. Or it feels a little of the shock that's coming, it is allowed to jump over into a safe compartment. And again, then, you have some of our people later on, as soon as they confront their blackness, they then seek to escape it and avoid it. We have another form of conditioning called avoidance conditioning. In this paradigm, you turn the light on as sort of a warning, and then you turn the juice on a little later. And you keep turning the light on, and then you turn the juice on, until the animal catches on that this light means that the juice is coming. And so you, and you allow it then to escape and avoid being shocked, you see. So after a while, as soon as the light comes on, it jumps over the barrier and escapes and attains relief. And so finally, when you condition it one day, that animal will jump almost literally forever, even though you never intend to turn on the juice anymore. But it never learns that the juice is not going to come on because it's always what? Jumping. We never learn the beauty of blackness. We never learn the beauty of being together and loving one another. We never learn the beauty of acting collectively and loving each other and putting each other first. Because the original conditioning by this evil man has associated our bodies and our colors with frightful things and frightful associations. And we then seek to avoid our blackness and our Africanness. And every time we confront it, we jump and move. And we never learn then what it really means to live out that Africanness and live out that blackness because it has been associated with anxiety and because when we first meet it that is what we feel and because we dare not stand up to the pain of our blackness we never learn its beauty and its glory that is why I tell you if you are to recapture yourself as a people you must go through pain for a while and you must live through the fear of blackness. And you must live through the anxiety of recognizing that you are a black person. And you must live through the anxiety of recognizing that you are an African. And you must real live through the anxiety of recognizing that you are stuck with your blackness and it's with you forever. 
and you're going to have to accept it for what it is and learn to live with it in happiness and in beauty. It is not going anywhere, ladies and gentlemen. But you have to face it and live through the negative associations that the European evil man has placed upon it. But if you're timid, if you can't stand the pain, then you must live in alienation and separation from yourself and self-hatred. Your black body is real. It is. It exists. It is reality. It is real. It is. What does that mean? That means when you escape from it, you escape from what? Yeah. Reality. You cannot avoid your blackness. You cannot avoid your Africanness and stay sane. The avoidance of your African heritage and the avoidance of your skin and the avoidance of seeing yourself in the mirror for who and what you are is a prescription for total insanity. And as long as you avoid your blackness and creep around it and rationalize it and deny it, then you're crazy and out of your mind. And you can see then why oppression is a process as set up by the European of making the black man crazy. And you may be high behind, I'm just human. No, you're also black. <laughs> I'm just a being in the world. No, you're also African. You also have a heritage. And that has to be integrated as a part of your personality. And you were also a slave. And that cannot be shunted aside. That too has to be accepted. With all of its pain and with all of its shame and with all of its guilt, it still has to be made, accepted and integrated into the personality. And if it's integrated correctly, ladies and gentlemen, it'll make you the most beautiful person in the world. The most loving person in the world. When you and when we integrate the shame of slavery and the guilt of slavery and the guilt of, of subordination to another group and the guilt of giving up control over ourselves to another people and accept it in its reality and accept it for what it is, we will outgrow our enemies. We will be superior to our enemies. We will achieve power again. We will achieve influence again. We will achieve respect again. We will bring into the world a whole new world order, a whole new morality, a whole new way of man relating to man. Because, because we have been the victims of slavery and discrimination and of scandal and of degradation, if we accept that for the reality that it is, and appropriately integrated into our personalities, then we will not impose degradation on other people, and we will not scandalize other people, and we will not destroy and degrade other people. And therefore, our power and being in the world will represent a new era of peace and, and, and relatively non-racialism. This is what's coming back, and it will bring back sanity in the world, ladies and gentlemen. It will reduce death in the world and murder in the world, and rape in the world, and exploitation in the world. And therefore, what we're trying to say, that the identification with our African selves and with our black selves is not merely a personal conversion and personal transformation. It is a transformation of the world and a change of the direction of the very world itself. In our next check, uh, section, then, we're going to look at quickly at some other methods, and we'll move into the behaviors that are a part of the so-called self-hatred and self-defeat syndrome. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. The floor is now open for comments and discussion. <laughs> thank you, Tom. The lecture was very good, very stimulating. Thank you. What after the question you brought up about our Africanism and our that we had. How, what are the corners to deal with that? You were saying that there's something we have to deal with. Often, uh, often you see me in, in rewriting history and um, the, the European of course has made us uh, frightened of reading about ourselves. You see, 
you rewrite the history of Africa, and of course you make Africans appear to have no culture, and, and all of the other things that we are all familiar with, and of course you project the Tarzan movies, and the whole bit. And therefore, uh, often children, and, and many of us even as adults, are reluctant to read Africa history because we think this is what we're going to run into. Or we've been convinced that there's nothing to it. So consequently, we are cut off from self-knowledge, and often we are also, and then by that we are also cut off from understanding the nature of our current situation and understanding the nature of the people, the Europeans that we are dealing with. So we suffer from a lack of, of self-awareness, and in, in the future lectures I'll talk a bit about uh, the kind of problems this lack of self-awareness uh, leads to. And of course, uh, we we don't want to get into slavery often because for many of us, it, we get angry. Uh, we get upset. Uh, I remember many people when they uh, viewed the movie Roots were you know, just literally upset. But I would demonstrate later on that often this anger and upsetness, if it is not appropriately uh, controlled and dealt with, is the very thing that exposes us to self-hatred, you see. Uh, it distorts our psychology and our minds and distorts then our perception of reality and closes down our creativity and our ability to deal competently with our, uh, with our current world. And uh, uh, yet, if we don't look at slavery forthrightly, and don't look at its nature and, and how it was a part of our creation, how it is today embedded into our very psychic as people, we really will not come to self-understanding and not being self-understanding and not bringing into consciousness that which is unconscious, we will lose our self-control. We, we would then have to stay under the control of another people. Is that the mm -hmm. saying the same thing as that why some of us now are putting the blue contact lenses in our eyes? And <laughs> it's very much related, uh, it's very much related to, to that, you see. Uh, and we'll talk about that in the next week's lecture when we talk about identification with the aggressor, where we seek to be like those who, uh, who dominate us uh, as a way of escaping our blackness, as a way of avoiding our blackness, our Africanness, because on a certain level it appears to give us some kind of relief. But in essence we know it increases uh, our slavery. We, uh, it, we are like uh, any sick person who goes to a psychiatrist or someone or even confronts himself, he must look at himself in terms of his real history because he is history. We are our history as individuals and as groups. And uh, consequently, we must look at them realistically in terms of self-understanding. And when we face the fears and anxiety connected with that confrontation, we will learn that we are bigger than those fears. We'll learn that we can look at ourselves without going crazy. We can look at our experience without being overwhelmed by anger and anxiety that we can look and, and, and confront ourselves and yet survive. When you do that, you have grown. You have conquered. It increases self-confidence and self-love. And it then prepares you to see a whole nother world that was once cut off because of the fears you see. So looking at this slave history and understanding it and understanding the history of colonialism and living through it is the means by which we will be released from that history. And from that point we can move forward. Yes, sir. <clears throat> and by the way, you don't have to just question, you can talk and comment. Okay, I was reading a book, <clears throat> reading a book called Cults in America, Program for Paradise. Mm -hmm. Now, they have a chapter called the Physiology of Brainwashing. Mm -hmm. You were talking about Pavlov. Later on in the Pavlov experiment, there was a flood in, in Leningrad. Now, when the flood happened, the dogs almost died. When the dogs were brought back into the experiment, they had forgotten the brainwashing. Yes. Now, mm -hmm. as you used to say before, we have to elevate the dog and individual up to a higher level. Mm -hmm. When the Jews went through what they went through, mm -hmm. it gave them a sense of unity. Mm -hmm. Do African Americans have to have six million of them on this and this no. time? No. no. Wait, wait, listen, listen. Yeah. Uh, African Americans uh, and African uh, in general uh, have to have a shock. Yeah. happened to them before he's going to wake them yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. I'm talking about Global 2000, I'm talking about right. age research. Wow. This information is out in the community, but you don't see a response until something happens. What do you think? At our current state of consciousness, it's, it's going to have to take something to shock us into yeah. reality. Unfortunately, I have to say that.
but I noticed, I noticed, that, I noticed that, I noticed that, I noticed that, that, that Zionism did not really develop until its full extent, until the Jews turned around and said, I'm not going back to Europe, I want something in my own. And we are so comfortable here. Many of us are so comfortable here, right? That we do not, that many of us want it as far as, as far as looking at, do these people have the capacity to practice genocide on us just like the Germans do. And if they do have the capacity, are they putting that, impl are they putting that into implementation at this time? And if they are doing it, what is going to be our response to it? Are we, are we going to wait till it happens? Or are we going to do something before that? Perhaps you want to respond. Yeah, I just wanted to say one thing and then I'm going to sit down. We have a, we have a, a particular attitude that if it don't hurt, it ain't good. In other words, in all, all the way through our life, uh, we, we go through life thinking that, well, hey man, um, if you want to get something out of life, you've got to sacrifice. If you want to do this, you've got to do this. And even in like the way you're putting it here, well, do we have to go through this terrible wrenching sort of thing before we can get our head together? Well, I, uh, I, don't, I don't personally, I don't think so because I, I have seen, well, maybe the, maybe the, the, the doctors right, say right, different. Right. I don't think so. I mean, we've had so many legitimately great men and women. The first one who comes to mind is Marcus Garvey. How come he could see, read the same books, blood pumping through his veins. Wait a minute, let me finish. Blood pumping through his veins just like you. One head, one arms, one leg, uh, two legs. He sat down. He educated himself. And after educate, how can Dr. Wilson here sit up here and speak the way he the way he does? He sat down and educated himself, and then went up. You don't have to. He didn't go through, uh, you know, letting out six quarts of blood and what have you. I mean, you can learn and then step right on through the daggone door. That's an answer to you. I don't know. Maybe you can say something. I want to respond to that. I'm not talking about individual consciousness. I realize that we have people like Elijah Muhammad. We have had people from day one who had the consciousness and the vision to see it. I'm talking about collectively. I'm not talking about an individual who who, who, who attained a certain consciousness and then started to try to tell his a people. A village is made up of individuals. Wait, wait a minute. A village is made up of individuals. A village is made up of individuals. A village is made up of individuals. I understand that. But in other words, if we're going to bring ourselves forward, we're not going to bring ourselves forward by one individual. We have a Masonic, a Masonic complex where we continue looking at a leader. We're only going to be able to liberate ourselves if our collective consciousness is of an extent that we can change. Yeah. Not just one person. Because right. if we're going to sit back, we're going to wait for Jesse. If Jesse don't do it, then we got to wait for somebody else. We have to be able to have a collective consciousness. If we continue focusing on one leader, then that leader can be duped, or that leader can be assassinated, and then we go back to sleep for 20 years. Do we got to wait for another 20 years for Malcolm? Do we? That's the question I want to answer. Yeah, I, I think, uh, just to add a little point to that, I think that when you look at what's happening in the schools, it may be really necessary to, um, to wake the young people up, that they witness what our four parents witnessed, that in fact, when we talk about the AIDS virus, and I often try to talk to my students about this whole thing about AIDS, since it has been revealed to me that AIDS, in fact, was a biological uh -huh. warfare okay. experiment done since 1969. And this has been new information to us in the book, um, um, Survey of Biological and uh, Chemical Warfare. Um, I, I believe it will take that because I was listening to, um, to, to LIB yesterday and LIB mentioned that one, uh, Run DMC made a record mm -hmm. advertising um, Cadillac mm -hmm. sneakers mm -hmm. and that when they asked Run DMC, do you understand the implications of this with all the chains and so on that you wear? Um, he said he didn't think about it. And I think one of the things that we have to realize is that people use thought and feelings as a justification for doing anything. My brother drinks, and when I ask him, well, why are you drinking? You know it's not doing I just felt like it. So what? You know, I felt like it. That's, that's how I feel, you know. I do what I feel, you know. I'm right. I, whatever I feel. And I think that we've got to make a distinction between reality, thoughts, and feelings. And I think you touched on that, yeah, and that's a very um, critical point. We definitely have to uh, look, look at that, because I think um, when you look at it from, from the point of view of psychology, you can almost say that 
that a good deal of our behavior, not the majority of our behavior, even our so-called thinking behavior, often is in defense of feelings. And it, uh, it's being used to justify feelings. And generally, when you see people even get up often and defend uh, themselves against so-called attacks, often it'll, it, in many instances, not in everyone at all, in many instances, sometimes if you look really closely, they're defending their feelings. Mm -hmm. They're defending anxiety. Mm -hmm. And even though they will project their defense in terms of logical argument, when you look at it uh, at depth, it's usually a defense of uh, uh, trying to assuage fear and uh, anxiety. Now, in terms of, of the, the statement that's going on here, certainly that is a very valid question and one that uh, we hear asked. Is it, is it necessary for us to suffer very badly before we, we can come to our senses and, and act in a collective way? That is a, a possible option, and that may be what it takes, even though there is no assurance that even the next shock will, um, will put us into collective action. Because often what happens in the neurotic individual is that and this is what makes people often, uh, this is how we classify neurotic people to a degree, is a neurosis is a certain kind of stupidity. You know, and I, it's a rough term, but I kind of have to use it there. In that they will, they will behave in such a way that's self-defeating. And yet you can say, hey, you, can't you see that the way you're behaving is leading to such and such and such a thing? Yeah, and yet, they'll do what? Do it again. Yeah, right. And when they fail again, they will do it more intensely again. This is, this is what Freud referred to often as the repetition compulsion. The neurotics seem to have a repetition compulsion, a compulsion to make what? The same mistake again and again and again, even when he intellectually recognizes that his behavior is the cause of his problem. But yet to recognize what you're dealing with in a neurotic personality is a personality that is emotionally unbalanced. One that uh, which behavior is dictated by emotions and feelings. And as you indicated, Joshua, it's this kind of issue you have to look at very closely. Now possibly, I, and I, I, I would certainly hate to think that we'd have to wait on another shock because my idea is if we went on another shot, we'll probably be uh, praying in front of the Capitol steps yeah. <laughs> like we did before and, and doing the old marching game that we got into before. Uh, and and, and uh, that may come up. But the other, there is another alternative uh, that someone mentioned too. Uh, and of course that is education. The kind of thing that we're engaged in now, a, a, a determination that we will educate the people that will educate our children a determination to educate our children, you see. Uh, but again, your issue is still there. Can we get enough people with that kind of idea to make it an effective one? I think we can. And when we get down to the latter part of the lecture, it is at this point where we're going to deal concretely with what particular method. How can we take two or three conscious people and yet have that consciousness spread over the world? We talked about Jesus tonight, one man. Right. Yeah. And look at uh, what he has the world in today. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, uh, so let us say it this way. Is it possible, perhaps, then, to take the consciousness of one or two people, or a few people, and yet uh, set up that consciousness in such a way that it can effectively spread out to the other people without us having to go? And that's how think about it uh, in your mind, and perhaps try to figure out if there is a way that we can use the consciousness of a small group to affect the behavior of many. Uh, you have been with the other. Yeah, uh, I want to uh, comment on his. Uh, the shock is already happening. It's our perception of, of what's going on. Apartheid is a, a global system. Mm -hmm. Black people in Brazil, black yes. people in, in Africa, black people in, uh, in Europe, mm -hmm. all live under the same conditions. It's a global condition. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the truth of the matter is that the, the, the shock is happening right now. They're dying like flies all over the world. The, the problem is, uh, in part, and of course there are many problems, uh, uh, shock can be shock. Mm -hmm. However, it takes often a, a certain state of mind to recognize it as such. And along with the shocks, 
have come the painkillers. <laughs> and and this is the other issue we have to deal with. Uh, and in fact, I've already mentioned painkillers in the lecture tonight. Of course, we're going to talk about the drugs, which is a very potent painkiller that reduces shock. Of course, escape is a, is, is a, a way of what? Getting out of shock. Identifying with the white man is a way of getting out of shock. Mm -hmm. Avoiding our blackness and African, Africanicity is a way of, uh, of escaping shock. And uh, I agree with you that shock does exist. Uh, however, we also have to deal with those shock absorbers that have been put into play as well. In a sense, we're almost in a race with will the shock absorbers increase to such an extent until we lose our sensitivity to uh, what's going on in the world. And maybe that's another reason why we may not be able to, to see shock as a, an option for waking us up, particularly in a world that turns out shock absorbers with such facility and in such uh, quantity. Uh, yes, young man, and then... Oh. <laughs> Could religion be called a drug because you know yeah. it seems to stop anxiety and or mm -hmm. uh, uncertainty? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and in such uh, quantity.
uh, religion. My belief is that the individual who is truly religious is an individual who is extremely realistic, yes. who, uh, who, who has been enlightening and has very clear vision, and who does not uh, run from reality, but confronts it and bases his behavior on reality, you see. And I think true religion opens one's eyes and increases one's clarity of vision and, and, and has one to confront reality and prepares one to deal with that reality. So consequently, the person who is truly religious does not fall subject to the hypnosis of sermons and music and all the other things that are laid out. But people who are caught up in false religion fall victims then to these kind of things. And uh, when these rituals and these kinds of mind games are projected as religion, then certainly religion in that sense becomes a mean of maintaining sleep and becomes an opiate for the people. When, uh, and we see that happening a great deal uh, in, in what we call the church. But I really like to keep uh, church separate from religion or from true spirituality. And often when we say religion, we're often talking about uh, the structure, the church itself. And, and that's, that's a whole different kind of, of bag. But note what I was dealing here with anything, anything, and we'll talk about this when we talk about drugs, that purports to, to relieve uncertainty can really have the effect of a religion, or what we call a religion, and, and influence the individual to behave in certain kind of ways. Yes, sir, and then we'll come back up front. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I, when you're talking uh, about um, speak up to the uh, when you mention the religion uh, a religious experience mm -hmm. I'm talking about direct experience mm -hmm. instead of mediated experience by other people or other or uh, ideologies or symbols mm -hmm. uh, I saw myself as in my own personal experiences, sometimes I had direct experiences with God that contradict uh, the way the church, Christian church, has interpreted that being that I am experiencing God. And I'm not talking, I'm not talking about going away to another religion or listen to other uh, concepts or other doctrinal points. I'm saying in my personal experience, then I have uh, gotten into the conflict of having revelatory or direct contact experiences with God, my personal God, which I, I believe, I have come to believe to the conviction that God is not a prescription that can be collectively given to everybody right. as rules for everybody in the same way. Mm. Right. For me, God is a very individual and a very personal reality. Mm -hmm. Then I got into problem with institutionalized religion. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems, that that's my question is going to, is that when I see myself and my people, and I, by the way, although I am Hispanic, you know that the same enemy of black right. and African people yeah. is the same en enemy of all oppressed people right. of the world. I, I think very much as an oppressed individual, of an oppressed people and community, of the institutionalized violence that white men have over our people. Mm -hmm. And their religious interpretation is that any violence, any counter-violence, any violence against that uh, um, oppressive system mm -hmm. is sinful, is bad, yeah. and you will be condemned by God. Mm -hmm. Then my question is this. My experience of God, and what I understand is God, and I have learned the God of the Bible is a God of love and justice. If uh, I have to act, and I mean not only physically. If I have, if he had to go physically, I'd be willing to. Mm -hmm. But I have to act violent against the oppressive system. Mm -hmm. Am I being? Uh, how can I be? Can I be? Am I denying my being and the true God? Mm -hmm. And in other ways, 
they uh, put labels to our people uh, if you do something that is not according to the morals of society. Mm. I myself have found out that for you to liberate ourselves of uh, oppressive ideology of white people, you have to sometimes, instead of acting so, uh, so rational as they have taught us to, and so, you know, like being accumulative, thinking accumulative, and additional, and thinking cumulative and very straight line, sometimes you have to act like uh, they would call us crazy. Like act out like risky, you know, confronting, and you know, so, some, so, some way they can be liberated. I don't know. Right. <laughs> of course you have, uh, the question you ask is a, is a very tough one. I will not intend to, uh, to certain, uh, provide an answer for it I'd like to make a quick, couple quick comments because I let other people respond to what you're saying there. I, I think what an interesting you you notice even for those of us who are in terms of, of uh, Christ is that Christ is having an ongoing battle with organized religion. Yeah. Right. His struggles are with what uh, Pharisees and, and uh, Sadducees and and other groups, and particularly is he fighting against. Uh, a legal a legalistic Judaism, yes. uh, which he sees has alienated the people from God and from their true spiritual relationship with God, and often this is not seen and 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 uh, implied then in in I think in his struggles. And of course, you can see ultimately it is organized religion that is in cahoots with the enemy to destroy him, because in a sense. He, he is attacking the doctors of the church and the lawyers of the church and the ones who have taken mosaic laws to the extreme and substituted the following of ritual and law for truly having God in their hearts, knowing that if they truly had God in their hearts, in a sense they would not need the law. A person who is totally identified with God and has God in their heart then behaves as uh, rightly as a result of having God in the heart and therefore does not have to read a book and, and to know how to behave under certain circumstances. A person alienated from God must run to the recipe book and must run to the, must run to the doctrinal book, you see. And what Jesus is wrestling with, in fact, I think in the Old Testament you have a rewriting of the law because God recognizes that the, the, the so-called law is written is getting a, in the way of people's truly spiritual development. Mm -hmm. And he says, this time he will write it where? In the, in the heart, heart of the individual, into the very soul and essence of the personality. But often in order for one to have those laws and, and godly knowledge and cosmic consciousness to be instilled directly into the personality, they have to empty their minds of all of, of human doctrines and rituals, remove them, and open themselves up totally to the input from the universe. And this is difficult to do. Because these laws and rituals, as I've indicated before, are the very thing that gives us a sense of meaning and, and security. And therefore, when we turn them loose, we experience tremendous anxiety and we experience tremendous personal disorganization. And often then, when the person moves toward that, he starts releasing these doctrines and other things, that fear gets so intense, he runs back into the, to the law and runs back into the church and therefore never directly re, uh, experience God. I think one of the functions then of, of a truly religious structure would be to train its members or to help them in how they themselves can achieve a direct relationship with God. Now, I have problems. I have not worked out whether God intends for us to make physical war or not with other people, okay? And I'm not, I said, I'm saying he's not, I'm just saying I haven't personally worked it through. However, I have looked at another aspect, and uh, that is the aspect that sometimes people have trouble with when they look at Jesus Christ when uh, he, he advocates uh, meekness. But let, let me put it this way, and when he talks about the meek shall inherit the earth, and, and I mean, it's a little difficult to, to, to see. But we have to recognize, and he talks about turning the other cheek and talks about forgiveness, right? Uh, we don't have time to talk about that tonight, but that is a very potent philosophy, by the way. To a good extent, we could collapse the European world 
not by going to war against it, but not participating with it. You know? Just, just turning loose its values. Turning loose its behavioral orientation. Stop digging in the gold mines in Africa. Stop digging up the minerals. Stop wanting to buy what they say we should buy. And stop participating in, in that kind of way. In other words, by assuming meekness and true humility, by reducing these values and things that they have pumped into us, we could collapse their world because their world is built upon our acting in terms of those values. And I think we could collapse that world in three weeks or two weeks if tomorrow we change our value system without having to fire a shot. Now, ultimately, we might have to fight the war, but the danger of fighting war directly often is recognized in religious teaching is that often, often it trusts and puts in, into us, us what we need to get out of the enemy. And so uh, as an alternative to that, uh, that, uh, that danger, the, the other thing is to completely, completely withdraw from the system. Now you're faced with your problem again, though, <laughs> though right? Can you get uh, enough collective people among us to affect this withdrawal and, re and, and repudiate these values upon which the European system is built such that it literally collapses of its own weight? That's another issue we might have to confront. Uh, in terms of time, I'd like to get back to you, Brother Vicente, but in terms of time. Mm -hmm. there, though, I think that if you look at the South African and I think even mm -hmm. the whites here all over, all these mm -hmm. missiles they made, mm -hmm. if they thought for a minute they were going to lose it all, mm -hmm. don't you think that as deranged as they are, and they have no choice, mm -hmm. think about this, they'll blow the whole thing up anyway. <laughs> I think these things weren't just made, you know, this is sort of like the man with the pill that takes it when there's nothing left. Uh -huh. well, that's so how I think Maybe possible, but that, that uh, it may be a risk we have to take. Let me just see, can I get a new hand here? Uh, well, this one is followed by Paul. Oh, yes, go ahead. Yes, come on. Stand up. Yes. I want to say, following what you were saying about allowing the Europeans to name us, well, my job entails working with people and therefore with names. I've come across several Africans who have names which I say do not match. For instance, they'll have an African last name, first name such as Mary or Pierre or John. And the first thing I would ask them is why is it that your first name matches your last name? And what I was told on several, several occasions was, well, wow, my first name is my Christian name. <laughs> and That's I, what it's referred to. Yes, I would say, well, brother, sister, your colonizer told you that, but that's nothing but a European name. Yes, and that first name is often referred to yeah. as this. And it's interesting, I think a part of our division from uh, our African brothers on the continent has to do with the way we are named, you know. Yeah. Have you ever heard someone on TV with your, with your same name? You know, or seen someone great with your same last name? and notice the pride and identity sometimes you, you get out of it even though they ain't no way related to you ah they have the same name i have you know somehow there seems to be something magical about that and, and, and an identity sort of takes place uh, at that moment and i think a part of the division that's maintained between us and africa is the fact that we are still many of us including myself are carrying these european names which uh, makes uh, even African names appear to be what? Foreign. And in a sense, uh, helps to make the African appear to be, in a sense, more foreign than is the white man because he has a, a quote unquote foreign name. And the European white man has a name that's what? More familiar, as in family. <laughs> you see? And uh, there's a psychology there that is very important. Of course, you can see in Elijah Muhammad the recognition of that psychology. Very, very much. And it's a very strong one, because I can even say personally, you know, the idea of changing name is, is represents a, a heavy psychological <laughs> thing that you, you don't recognize the degree to which you are tied to uh, certain people until you decide that you're going to try to make a name change. It also, mm -hmm. um, by, tra by just looking at names mm -hmm. and the individual who possesses it, you can just trace colonization mm -hmm. of other than European people by the Europeans. Very. For instance, when you look at an Asian whose name is Maria Gonzalez, that's kind of strange, isn't it? Yeah, it because is. the Spaniards yes. colonized the Filipinos. Yeah, it's something. Right. 
Uh, that's very interesting because I've noted before, you can do a history of naming and look at the way people name in terms of their mental state. And it's very interesting to look at the history of black people in terms of the way our names have changed over decades. Yeah. Right? And you remember when the Moniques were in? <laughs> you got, forgive me, Moniques. <laughs> And of course, Amos is one of those names too. And of course, the Bible names were in, and then the French names were in, and then we went through a little period there in the 60s where what? The African uh, Arab names were in. And now we've passed through that phase and we're back into some other kind of names. And I think very much names and how people are, are named uh, is a very potent indicator of the consciousness of a people and a very potent indicator of the relationship those people have with the world, which sort of gives, uh, it makes us pay great attention to why uh, more ancient people and, and our ancestors uh, took naming very seriously, extremely seriously, because it, was, it, 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 it involves more than attaching an identification tag to someone. In a name is implied a whole ideology, philosophy, and attitude toward the world and relationship to the world. And I think it's fascinating if we will look at the psychology of naming as indicative of uh, our own psychology uh, as people. As I say again, you see that in Elijah Muhammad, who I think, regardless as to what other things people may think about Muhammad, I still must recognize him as having one of the keenest psychological insights into the psyche of the black man uh, that has ever existed. And you can, one of the things where you see it is in this process of where he dealt with names. And of course you see it, you Christians, you see it in your religion, don't you? Right? When you get Jesus, what happens to you? You change your name. Oh. <laughs> yeah. You're, and so there's something about naming that indicates a state of being. A name is changed over. Yes, uh, look. I just wanted to uh, make a point uh, referring to the earlier point about violence. And that is that uh, very few Christians actually uh, realize there's a passage in which Jesus calls on his disciples to actually buy swords. Yeah. Uh, in Luke 22. And uh, without getting to a deep sermon on that, but it's just the aspect of being prepared for violence and realizing that some things are worth actually making the sacrifice of one's own life for mm -hmm. in order to ensure the safety of others one has to often intercede in a violent manner so therefore sometimes violence and self-defense have to be distinguished mm -hmm. and surely each religion and each philosophy makes a provision of accepting self-defense mm -hmm. yeah, there, 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 there are those there is that troubling passage of course uh, where G, uh, in fact Peter wears a sword to a very good extent, and of course they, there is that point you, you uh, point to also where there is, Jesus is attributed to his admonishing that uh, some arming of uh, the disciples take place. And of course the other troubling section of, is where Jesus comes in and even though he may not commit violence on the people, he sort of violently deals with the money changers uh, in the church. Uh, and why we cannot re resolve that here, um, Exactly, the church, my thoughts in it are incomplete. I think, though, if, if one is to engage in violence, particularly defensive aggression, uh, I think one of the, the major things that makes the difference is, of course, the source and the motivation for that aggression. And if we're going to engage then in violence against the enemy, that violence uh, that we engage in must be based not in terms of hatred, you see, not in terms of, of uh, distorted kinds of hostility, you see, but in, in, in terms of a, a uh, try, at least in terms of a purity of, of motive. Ideally, you will defeat your enemy calmly and break his arms uh, calmly and in peace, <laughs> you see. Uh, as a, as a way of, and so while you're defending yourself, you don't defend yourself, what, in great anger and hostility, you see, because by defending, yet at the same time, it's like sometimes when you punish children, and even if you engage in a little corporal punishment, you try to